Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tatiana Khotyaintseva. I work as a software engineer at Allegro within the Asgard team, which is a part of infrastructure and IT operations. And my team is responsible for internal monitoring tools. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is quit underscore ka. And today I would like to talk to you about visualization of microservice architectures. At Allegro, who, who has ever used Allegro here? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Probably um, mo almost everyone. At least everyone from Poland. So Allegro is a Polish e-commerce platform. Uh, it has 5.8 million of active users per month and 18.1 million of transactions per month. It's the fifth most popular website in Poland, only behind Google, YouTube and Facebook. And at Allegro, we put high priority at feature velocity. We believe that one of our critical competitive advantages is the rate at which we introduce new features. And so to get feature velocity, one of the architectural choices that Allegro has made uh, a while back was to move to microservice architecture. So instead of a monolith, we have multiple services and a service might handle only login or a service might handle only payment data, that sort of thing. So when somebody uses Allegro, from a laptop or a mobile device, what have you, a request comes in, and we just have a hypothetical example here. A request comes in and hits a service D. And the service might be a proxy or an API layer, and whatever that service is, it, n it is not going to have all the information it needs to, to serve the response. So service D is going to reach out to services B and E, and service B is going to reach out to services A and C, and you can see this pretty quickly, but it's quite complicated. Now, Allegro has more than 500 microservices, and new microservices appear every day. So you can imagine that at the scale at which Allegro operates, visualizing and understanding communication patterns between microservices becomes a non-trivial task. Now, who of you has ever tried to sit down and draw what their application looks like on a whiteboard? Probably a lot of you. And who has ever got it wrong? I know I did. Yeah, right, and it's, it's a real problem. You see, we have this institutionalized knowledge. People, when they come to organizations, they are taught what the application looks like. And then, of course, they pass this knowledge on to someone else. But between the times that were they were taught and the time they teach someone else, the application has changed and they don't know about it. So coming back to the question of visualization of microservice architectures, wouldn't it be nice if there was a tool out there that could draw you a map of your application that would just go out there and discover what the topology of your application was? So I'm a part of the team responsible for monitoring tools. And one of the challenges we are facing is the need to get live feedback on hundreds of microservices into data centers. And to get a gut feeling of whether the system as a whole is doing okay or not. And when you think monitoring, you think dashboards. And dashboards are great, but they're great for reactive monitoring. You've been alerted, go look at the dashboard and see what has changed. Uh, in fact, most standard visualization tools are not meant to be stared at in real time. They are good for showing exact numbers and how they correlate to each other. And a more something of, let's something has happened, let's go have a look and investigate, see what has changed and when it started. But what we need is that we need to know the now to just be able to take a quick glance and see that something would be going wrong. And we are not the only ones who are facing this need. The whole approach of getting a gut feeling about holistic state of the system was popularized by Netflix, who called it intuition engineering. And Netflix developed a tool called Visceral to aid their engineers in performing traffic failovers between AWS availability zones. So let's have a look at the Visceral. This is the main view. The middle circle represents the internet. And you, you can see the numbers in there. Numbers show the volume of the traffic. Please, please come in. <laughs> you don't have to stand there. There are places to sit. So please do come in. 
Uh, so the numbers in there represent the request volume, rec requests coming in per second, and the error rate for the traffic. You can see there are a lot of dots moving from the internet to the surrounding circles, with each of those circles representing one of the AWS availability zones that Netflix is in. Now, what is really nice about this view is that it's fairly easy to tell the traffic volume. Like, you can easily see that US East is taking in the most traffic, US West is second, and EU West is trailing closely behind. Little dots have colors. Uh, normal is light blue, and color theory teaches us that blue is a calm, neutral color, so you don't get any weird feelings of dread by looking at this. If you look closely, I hope you can see it. If you look closely, closely you there are some red and yellow dots in there. So red dots mean that there was a request that resulted in error response, and yellow dots mean that there was a request that res resulted in a degraded response. For example, one of the rows was missing from a list of movies. It is possible to drill into a region, to kind of zoom in and see the services within this region. And here the idea is the same. Traffic is flowing in from the internet on the left, flowing into the edge services. The same traffic dot coloring applies here. Normal, like normal requests are light blue. Uh, warnings are yellow. Degraded responses are yellow and red are errors. There is a side panel for each service. So if you see something weird is going on, here you can dig a little deeper. Here you can have links to dashboards or deploy info. And we are purposefully staying away from this information and visceral because we don't want to overwhelm the person using it with the information that is not necessary for the task at hand. Uh, nodes and yeah, there is a third view. You can zoom in even further to see the connections of an individual service. Uh, nodes and connections can have notices. Notices are additional information that shows up in a sidebar. Uh, typically, it's also monitoring uh, alerts. For example, here there is a warning between. A s is there a laser pointer here? I'm sorry. Yeah, can I have one? Okay. So here you can see a little yellow warning on a connection between a service and the internet. And by clicking on that, we can learn more about this warning. So now I would like you to show the visceral in action. We will see how traffic failover de demonstration looks like. Uh, this is a normal state. Traffic is flowing into all three regions. And now you can start. There are some errors happening in US East. Here in yellow. So the engineers notice that something goes wrong with the in that region and they start uh, scaling up the other two regions so that they can serve the traffic of the users being affected in US East. And soon they start to proxy traffic from US East to the other two regions. It's a slow process. They slowly proxy more and more, tra more, and more traffic as the regions are scaling up. And as soon as maximum traffic is proxied out of US East, they can flip the DNS, which they cannot flip first because that would overwhelm the other two regions. So here they flip the DNS, and now all of the traffic is being served by the other two regions by the in while the engineers are figuring out what went wrong with US East and getting it back up. As soon as the problem is fixed, they can do it all in reverse. They flip the DNS again and slowly dial back the proxy in until the system gets back to a steady state. Now, what is really nice about this demo is that you can easily understand what is happening. I'm sure that even without my comments, each of you could easily understand where the traffic was flowing and where the errors were happening and when DNS was switched. And so this is something that is very hard to achieve with a dashboard. And this is exactly what Visceral is for. So at Allegro, we have taken the open sourced front end part of Visceral and created a tool called Phobos. Phobos uses Visceral, and yet it is quite different from it in many ways. 
First of all, we are not interested in traffic info. We are more interested in how requests relate to specific business processes. So for example, something goes wrong with the service A. The question we are interested in is uh, what other services might have a degraded performance because of it? And uh, which business processes may be affected by it? Let me show you a demo of Phobos. This is the main view. The middle circle represents the internet. And there are a lot of dots moving from the internet to the surrounding circles, with each of those circles representing one of the business areas that service is in. At Allegro, we group microservices into so-called business areas, according to their business purpose. So one area can contain all microservices that handle user data, and another can contain all microservices that handle item listings, and so on. It is also possible to drill into an area, similarly to the original visceral, And inside, you can see services within this area in green, other areas in blue, and communication between them. There is a side panel for each service, uh, where you can have a list of hosts, connections, monitoring alerts, links to pager duty, deploy info, and other integrations. It is possible to zoom in even further to see individual hosts of a service and their state and connections. Phobos is integrated with our monitoring stack, so you can see when services are having issues. Uh, services with monitoring alerts with error or critical severity are shown in red, and services with monitoring alerts with uh, warning severity are shown in yellow, and here there are no warnings, but there are two. Okay, one is hidden behind this little panel, which I don't know how to get rid of, but okay, let's try one more time. No, it doesn't disappear. Okay, disappeared. Here, the two services that are having errors at the moment. Let's now have a look at the technological stack of Phobos. On the front-end side, we use Visceral, which is written in WebGL using 3GS library. And on top of Visceral, we use Visceral React Wrapper. The back-end consists of four logical parts. To get the data about the connections between services, we use two sources. First, we have host runners, little demons written in Go, that collect information about TCP connections from Netstat. Second, we use Zipkin trace IDs. The data from both of the sources lands in Apache Kafka and is then processed by Spark streaming jobs. The results of the jobs are saved into Cassandra database, and finally, there is Phobos backend itself, which is written in Python using Django REST framework. It crunches the data from Cassandra database and exposes it in the form that Visceral understands. Visceral expects to receive service connection graph in a form of a single JSON object. And the structure of this object is pretty straightforward. There is a root node which has nodes and connections. And every node, in turn, can have its own nodes and connections. And this is how Visceral allows the drill down functionality. So here, for example, you can see there is a US West 2 node, which has two subnodes, Internet and API Proxy Prod. And there is a connection between them. Apart from nodes and connections, the, uh, a node can have a renderer, max volume, notices, metadata, and name properties. So name is self-explanatory. Renderer specifies which renderer to use for a given graph. Uh, Visceral originally supports only two of them, which is global and region. And we have written two more, one to allow uh, drilling into nested areas, and uh, one more to allow drilling into a service to see the host of this service. 
Max volume is, is the maximum volume of requests that was seen recently. It is necessary to determine relative particle density uh, to render the connections. Notices are monitoring alerts that you want to show up on the sidebar. And everything else, like some data that is used by plugins, lands in the metadata property. Uh, so one of the optimizations that we have made is we separated the notices from the rest of the graph. So here you can see that the notices array uh, here, right? Uh, notices must be here. However, we fetch uh, the connection data separately from the notices. Uh, if you think about it, the connections between microservices don't, don't change as often as monitoring alerts do. So what we do is we fetch the connection data every minute and we fetch the monitoring alert data every 30 seconds. This allows us to have higher temporal resol resolution for notices while still keeping the two performant. And second optimization that we've made is we do not fetch the whole uh, service connection graph at once. We only fetch the part of it that is necessary to render the current view. So when we render the main view, we fetch only the edge, the edge node together with its children and their connections. And when we fetch and when we la when we render an area view, we only fetch uh, the data for this area. So how do we create the service connection graph? As I've mentioned before, there are two sources. First, there are host runners that collect information about TCP connections. And second, there are Zipkin trace IDs. So let's start with the host runners first. Service connection graph has nodes and edges. Nodes are service names, and edges are connect TCP connections between them. Um, most microservices at Allegro are written in Java or other JVM languages, and they run on a Mesos cluster. They are not containerized. So getting service names is as easy as running PS on a Mesos node, grepping for Java, and then extracting service name with a regular expression. Uh, getting connections is a little bit trickier. There are a couple of ways you can get information about TCP connections of a process. First, there is a tool called ConTrack. It gives you a live stream of events showing when connections are created and destroyed. And second, there is proc file system inside of which you have TCP tables. And you can look at that either directly or using some of the command line tools that provide a wrapper around it. And we have chosen to use the latter approach. So host runners use the Go PS util library, which is Python PS util library ported to Go. Uh, this library provides many functionalities of the Unix command line tools, such as PS, top, net, stat, and many, many others. And using Go PS util li library, we can get information about running processes and their open TCP connections. However, getting information about TCP connections is expensive. So we have to rate limit how much we do it, otherwise we are going to waste all our CPU cycles by monitoring the applications that we are supposed to run. So we have to, do to fetch only snapshots of connections and we are going to miss all the short-lived connections that were created and destroyed between the polling periods. But that's, well, that's okay, we can live with that. So host runners scrape the system-wide network stats and send the data in, a in Avro format to Apache Kafka. This is how the resulting data structure looks like. Uh, for each host, there is a list of uh, IP addresses and processes. Processes have name and a list of connections. And connections have local address and port, foreign address and port, and state. Now let's talk about the second piece of a puzzle, uh, Zipkin trace IDs. Distributed tracing is not a new topic. It starts with the idea that when you had a monolith, you could do profile, uh, which would give you all the information you need to debug to figure out where the application spends its time and figure out the performance issues of your application. But now, in the world of microservices, each request is going to be handled by multiple microservices. And you cannot just go out there and profile each of them to figure out where the request spent its time. So you end up with the idea of distributed tracing, which does exactly that. 
it, tra it traces out the request as they flow through your microservice application. And the most popular tool for this in the open source world is called Zipkin. It was written by Twitter based on the Google Dapper paper, and this is what we use. So Zipkin does a very detailed structured login of individual requests, of what a single request is doing within your system. If your service receives a request and then makes a request, the second request is con considered a child of the first one. And now you can assemble a hierarchy of events by assigning an ID to a request and then passing it along to the child request. Let's see a little example. Let's say we have three services, A, B, and C. And service A receives a request. Now, first of all, we do not trace all of the requests. That would just not be possible in production. So the first service that receives a request decides whether it's going to be traced or not. So let's say service A receives a request and decides that it's going to be traced. So it assigns a trace ID to it and a span ID. In our case, trace ID is one and span ID is a pentagon. And there are four main events, server received server sent event and client received client sent event. So service A, as it receives the event, it sends a server received event with this trace ID and this span ID. And the little empty place here means that there is no parent because it's the very first request that comes into the system. Uh, then service A makes a client request to service B and it sends a client sent event with a new span ID, which is a circle, with a parent ID sent to set to previous span ID, which is a pentagon, and it passes along the same trace ID. As service B receives the request, it sends a server received event with exactly the same data, and now we can match the two up. Th then the same is repeated for the client request from B to C, and then C replies, it sends a server sent event saying, I'm replying to this request. And service B, when it receives the reply, sends a client received event. And then the same is repeated for service B and service A. So as a downside, this approach requires all teams to modify the, uh, their microservices. Some of the teams may be releasing twice a day, some of the teams may be releasing less often, and some of the software may even have been disowned in your organization, and yet, yet it is still there, and it still needs to be instrumented. So you get an organizational problem which complicates the adoption of distributed tracing. But now when we have data from Zipkin trace IDs and data from host runners, it is collected in Apache Kafka and we run Spark streaming jobs on it. Uh, those jobs uh, replace IP addresses with service names, they remove duplicates and bring data to the form of a map where keys are source, source and destination service names and values are a list of distinct connections between them. As a final note, uh, we store uh, connection map snapshots in the Cassandra database. And I mentioned before that on the front-end side, we only fetch the data we need to render the current view, not the whole uh, connection snapshot. However, on the back-end side, we are still fetching the whole service map graph from Cassandra database, because with the current setup, it is not possible to get connections only for a given node from the database. So to give ourselves more freedom in data manipulation, we are currently migrating from Cassandra to a graph database or NDB. And this is still a work in progress. So what are the use cases for this tool? Uh, first of all, first and foremost, it is useful during outages when one has to quickly determine what is the scope of a problem and what microservices are affected and what business processes are affected. It is useful during post-mortems. Uh, Phobos stores extensive history of events, so you can see what was the state of the system yesterday or even a few months ago. And of course, it is useful for visualizing application architecture and understanding the flow of requests. 
Uh, so, I wanted to share with you this idea of intuition engineering and show you tools that could give us an interface to a very complex system and give us the capability of developing an intuition about the state of this system. This is the amazing team I get to work with. Maciej Jagielowicz is our team leader, Lukasz Pavel, Arek, Hubert and myself. And thank you very much for your attention. So, any questions to ask? Here's one. Hi, mm. great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you are using Zipkin traces, so it means that every application is aware of Zipkin and every client communication is wrapped into the Zipkin communication, right? Do you it's no. No? No, uh, sadly no. We would like it to be that way, but uh, it's, as I said, there is an organizational problem because uh, it has to be configured by every team, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm asking. Uh, so, so, no, we must not, not, must not everyone has done it, no not right, yet. But, but they should. Right? Yeah, they should, that, that, definitely. That's the main issue with Zipkin, actually. Right? Yes, like and there is, there is even a person at our team who is responsible for going and poking people around <laughs> and saying, do it, do it, finally do it, but... Yeah. Uh, so you operate only on Java? Uh, what, what there are, I don't know, there's Zipkin for other languages or are you just Java based and you don't have this problem? What if someone would decide to go with, I don't know, communicate Python with Java or maybe PHP or something? Oh, okay. I yeah, so we have PHP, we have Python, we have Go and uh, it's pretty heterogeneous system. Uh, even though most of the microservices are written in Java or in Kotlin or in Scala. And uh, we are working on bringing it all, on all together on the same footing. Okay, thank you. I have uh, one question. Uh, you have a system, monitoring system, uh, very long time with uh, many links what happened uh, when one link is fail? You mm. understand? Sorry, my English is so not good. <laughs> um, no, I'm not sure I understand. Okay, uh, what tool monitoring your, t your tool? What happened when the one of uh, link in chain uh, fail? Okay, I, I understood now. Uh, so, uh, we monitor the Spark jobs and we monitor the uh, Phobos backend and uh, then our team gets a, a monitoring alerts whenever something happens. We just get pager duty, peep, 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 peep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, great talk. Uh, my question is like uh, before, uh, what is the estimated time between gathering the data on the nodes and uh, visualizing them because you have the, the pipeline of the data processing is pretty uh, complex. It's around one minute. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, great talk. Um, I'm assuming that you are uh, also using uh, some kind of messaging, Rabbit, for example. And if, if you are, uh, does this uh, system also cover that? The can you trace like the events that are um, exchanged between the services? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, f we are not using Rabbit. We are using system uh, which is based on Apache Kafka. And yes, we can cover that. start the pack uh, in Phobos you had uh, the maps with IP addresses and ports to uh, select connections and what metric do you use to decide on volume of the dots between uh, the services it's just number of distinct connections it's not a volume of HTTP requests I 
also one more. I see you. <laughs> okay, uh, you mentioned that uh, for the network metrics you're scraping the protsnet and its uh, heavy process it and the other uh, alternative you mentioned in wa was contract did you consider the ebpf as a alternative solution uh, for the getting the metrics that would that way you will uh, definitely lower the overhead of the uh, metrics uh, gathering uh, first thing and second you will get uh, much more granular uh, data even uh, the uh, short living connections you mentioned that you are uh, losing during mm -hmm. the pooling okay that's a great question thank you uh, sadly i do not know the answer for it because uh, i this solution was chosen before i started working at the team so I just don't know how they decided to use this and not the other solution. Okay. But thank you. Any more questions? Oh, I see one. Thank you for awesome talk. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, Phobos is uh, your internal tool. It's not open source, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, you're right. Okay, so if you would like, for example, hypothetically, you would like to open source it, how much uh, work would be required to make it uh, like universal tool? How much it's uh, how much it's really specific for your infrastructure? It's pretty specific for our infrastructure. Some parts, such as host runners, probably could be open sourced. Uh, with little effort, but uh, other parts they rely heavily on internal uh, workings of our, of our system, and I, I don't think they could be open sourced easily. Any more questions? I see none. Then, big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.